Alex Direke is founding director of DRMN, a London-based international studio of architects and designers founded in 1995 and led by Alex Direke, Philip Marsh, Sadie Morgan, and Jonas Lenser. Alex's stressed areas is integration of landscape, architecture, furniture, and art. Alex's leadership in DRMM has become recognized as a pioneer and authority on engineered timber, design, and construction, especially cross-laminated timber. He is a design champion at DRMM, responsible for the concept, construction, and delivery of timber projects. Some of his diverse projects are the Sliding House, Kingsdale School, Shelton Workstack, Tower of Love, Endless Stair, Woodblock House, Maggie Soldan, and the Sterling Prize winning Hashing Spear. He is a promoter of learning through experimentation and making, and his extensive experience in academics includes being the professor of master's program and dean of architecture at the Royal College of Art. Alex is currently an ex external examiner to design and design and make timber program at the Architectural Association and a visiting professor to the Royal College of Art, London. He also lectures internationally, presenting DRMM's work from Scandinavia and Europe to Asia and Australasia. Alex conducts ongoing research into contemporary materials, technologies, and methods of construction. In 2006, he wrote, Timber is the new concrete, where he talks about how fast-growing softwood timber can be the successor of concrete. He has given conference papers on a range of themes including engineered timber architecture and construction, prefabricated and mobile architecture, and the relationship between architecture and health. In 2013, Raike, along with AHEC and ARUP, invested invented the first cross-laminated timber made from a hardwood and in the form of endless stair demonstrated its incomparable beauty, strength and sustainability in the LDF 2013 installation at Tate Modern. The DRMM's Maggie Cancer, Cent Cancer Care Center in Oldham Building is a synthesis of concept, construction and user well-being made entirely from tulip wood, CLT and glass. With a parallel passion as photographer, Alex photographs for publications and exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale 2008 and 2012, and documents DRMM's projects on an ongoing basis. Please join me in welcoming Alex Duraike. Uh, I also would like to welcome uh, Tony, uh, who is also a fashion designer, who is uh, who's also here with Alex to help us out. So I extend our welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And good morning. Thank you to Tony, who's not here, but I want to register my appreciation to Tony and the faculty for this invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to come here. Um, so this invitation it means a lot to me. Um, now, I don't have to tell you to turn off your mobile phones, do I? No. 
because you never look at social media. So um, I intend to inform and even entertain you in a way that I hope isn't typical of architects because I may be an architect but I don't wear black and I'm um, perhaps on a kind of edge, a re slightly rebellious edge of architecture that um, wants to change the profession. And I think that's possibly a good alignment with Arveni because you don't do straight market architecture here. So uh, there's a message here um, and there's also a quick test. To establish the theme of this lecture, that there is a quick test and you will have to answer by showing your hands. So, okay. so he, who sees the glass half full? Okay, and who sees the glass half empty? Okay, there's many more optimists than pessimists in the room, but um, I see a glass much bigger than it needs to be. And I also wonder, is the glass recycled? Is it going to break? So there's optimism and pessimism, but there's also critical design sensibility. And I think I want this lecture to remain in your head as um, a, a discussion about design choices. It's, it's a very wobbly uh, stand here. I think I'm going to take this cable out so it doesn't wobble. Yeah, it, it's, it's wonderful to be here in Kerala because that's too loud now, isn't it? You can't hear me? Well, if you turn it down, turn it down, then I'll put it closer to my mouth. Right down, right down, right down. More, 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 more. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me now? Okay. Right, it's really great to be here as a European because of the people and because of the trees. I'm, this is on the way here. We came by motorbike, um, and this is Route 66. But I understand that Catalan people say that trees are the earth speaking to heaven. And it, it, we should remind ourselves that trees very generously provide absorption of carbon and other pollutants, the production of oxygen, food, fuel, construction material, and even compost. They offer protection, obviously from sun, but also from wind. They offer light control. They offer air temperature control. They offer soil erosion regulation. And they offer a home for many species. You know, not just birds, obviously, but monkeys, many species, even in death, even in the tree's death. They offer habitat for insects and worms and so on. So they offer beauty, which is the familiar role of trees. We think of them as beautiful things, but they work incredibly hard all the time, even when they're dead. And I worry that the architects and the builders of Kerala, like Europe, have stopped seeing how great the trees are. And trees are being replaced with steel and concrete buildings which need air conditioning because the shade is gone. And it's a cycle of carbon production and non-absorption. It's a cycle of energy dependence, not regeneration. This is global timber production um, taken from a few years ago. And um, you'll see in the UK there's nothing worth noting. Um, but the blue zone is the zone of business that I engage with. So th this is managed forestry that is um, coniferous. It's basically spruce trees and fir trees. And I have to say that most of it is um, construction industry, except in the UK, where there is some, but it's only used for paper or firewood or fencing or Christmas trees, which for me is a, a tragedy. 
Now, um, the black diagram you should be familiar with as any kind of designer, whether you're an architect or a furniture maker or a landscape designer. It's just a simple problem that we have that one ton of iron is the equivalent of a ton and a half to two tons, depending on how it's made, how the smelting process works. But basically, a ton of steel is roughly two tons of carbon produced just to make that material. A ton of cement is about a ton of carbon. A ton of concrete is slightly less, but then you have to add steel and water and even waste timber to cast it. And then you see timber, the only material that operates the other way, and it's effectively 1.4, 1.5 tons of carbon absorbed and not released. So it's a no-brainer to use it. Now, at present, there's a meter cubed of concrete for every human, every human being in the world has a cubic meter of concrete built somewhere, not necessarily near them, it might be on the other side of the planet, but everyone is accounted for. It's the second material made in the world after bread. By 2050, thinking of other materials that don't do our planet any good, by 2050 there, there will be more plastic than fish in the oceans. This is a fact. This is the scariest statistic I know. And I'm so pleased to see how in India there is definitely a movement to reduce plastic and control it and even stop using it, which is fantastic to see. But there's a lot to do. And to control the climate crisis and to make a sustainable world, billions of trees need to be planted because that's the only way to reverse the cycle of energy dependence and carbon emissions. I mean, the examples shown here, I'm not sure if it's clear to you, but this is an African project. It's very exciting. It, it's, it's called the Great Green Wall, and it's a, a wall of trees stretching from Senegal to Ethiopia. And so far, 11.5 million trees have already been planted in Senegal so far, and that's just this part of the map. Ending here in Djibouti, just past... Um, Ethiopia. And I, I'm, I'm heartened to see that countries which don't necessarily have the resources to think um, on such a grand scale are going ahead and doing it. Meanwhile, on, on the underground train in London, you see pictures like this saying, help us recycle. But I say, stop waste. Even recycling takes energy. And in a sense, the damage is done because uh, this free issue newspaper that's rep represented here is simply gossip and advertisements disguised as news and internet negates the need to print in any case. So they say help recycle by taking yours with you. Um, well, it's smarter not to print it at all. Just use, just use the wood for construction. This is to remind us that we don't need to rely on big trees anymore. Timber technology is now far more sophisticated. We're in a kind of renaissance of research and development whereby there is no longer a reliance on large trees to produce construction timber. Rather, that we can make, through the laminating process, we can make enormous pieces of timber from small ones. So small, fast-growing species can provide the kind of strength and section of what in the olden days would have been trees that were hundreds of years old. And obviously are too precious to simply cut down. You know, um, hardwood species are generally, in my view, left alone, best left alone to carry on the excellent work they're doing in carbon exchange and oxygen production. We don't need them. We need to focus on growing fast and um, expedient crops of timber that work in mixed forestry rather than um, a kind of uh, monoculture of, say, palms or eucalyptus. We need variety for the biodiversity. But then, anyway, 
getting back to the point, um, we can make special wood from cheap, ordinary wood. Robotic, um, computer controlled, and the, I mean a CNC machine of this scale in Germany is basically making from spruce trees and pine trees panels that are three meters wide and up to 20 meters long. So you can literally make the facade of a single story building in one piece. And I see this process of uh, robotic prefabricated manufacturing as eventually um, occupying the space currently taken by automo automobile manufacturing. So as steel becomes obsolete, those premises and those um, prefabrication sequence machineries can be adapted to simply operate using um, the material of the future, engineered timber. Now I'm going to show you some projects. The first of which is uh, this naked house idea. It was a, uh, a response in 2006 to the idea that climate change was becoming uh, evident. This is New Orleans. It's a fantastic photograph by an uh, American called Robert Polidori. After the flood, he published a book only of New Orleans after the flood. And it was a bore witness not only to the bad construction and the bad thinking behind the disaster, but um, it inspired me to try and make um, a new kind of timber, single, single family house. This was a conceptual sketch, thinking of it as made of entirely computer cut prefabricated elements that would be able to stack inside a shipping container and travel anywhere in the world where there might be a disaster or there may just be a need for affordable housing. Truly affordable, not affordable for some, but a very cheap form of housing that was based just on interlocking timber panels like a jigsaw puzzle. And these could be assembled in a few days. And the pleasure of that process became part of the pattern of the house and its relation to human scale was a very important factor and one of the pleasures of working in wood, in fact, that it does have a scale built in, in the grain of the timber. These panels, by the way, um, correspond entirely with the factory departure point. So the, the departure point of the conveyor belt is this, that's the three meters. In this case, this is 13, this is eight. These Proportions all correspond with the Fibonacci golden ratio. So every element of the house was cut from complete panels, so there was no waste. And all the offcuts are the furniture for the house. So if you need a bed, you have a window the size of a bed. If you need, say, a table and a chair, then that table has a window of equivalent size. The house was made as a prototype in 2006 in Oslo and is going to be reconstructed next year in Portugal. The intention was to construct it in London as a kind of demonstration of uh, an ecologically provocative has, in fact, the first flat-packed timber house, but um, it, this never happened. The Tate overspent on um, Herzog and de Murdon's rear extension. This project, Kingsdale School, was remarkable in that uh, the government, the Labour government, which at the time was more socialist than... Um, the center, the center left that we have now, had a, a program to replace every school in the UK, every secondary state school. And this was um, a project to reconfigure an existing school building post-war, the 1960s steel and glass building, very thin envelope, always too hot or too cold. 
And the existing building, which you can see here, steel frame and glass, we covered with an inflatable roof to make a secondary climate inside what was an open courtyard space. And within that space, we could put all the circulation and all of the social spaces that we needed to construct rather than it simply being um, unused external space. So originally it was like this. This is the very familiar 1960s post-war school. That was a girls' courtyard. They didn't use it. They thought it was patronizing. The boys' courtyard was used for football and for breaking all of these windows. And various other buildings on the site were um, not used enough. And the, the poverty of this school, this was a uh, black school. It was known as a school in special measures, a school with problems. And the students were brought by bus from a, a poor area of London called Brixton to study here, ne next to the most expensive school in the whole of London, which is Dulwich Prep School. And we thought this was a great opportunity to make wonderful architecture so that the poor school would have better buildings than the rich school next door. And it became a project about transforming the existing building, so not demolishing it, not trying to erase history, but to upgrade and recycle the existing building and to make new facilities like a new sports hall, music building, a sixth form, and so on. And to basically regenerate rather than replace. The roof covering the school was at the time the first use of uh, ETFE as a, a solar control mechanism. So this was a membrane which can respond to levels of sunlight. As it gets hotter, uh, monitors register the heat and the light and inflate the cushions differently so that internally shade can be controlled by an overlapping of patterns. And a later, a later phase of the same project, having completed this with its timber auditorium, we made this building and this building, which were the first um, cross-laminated timber buildings in the UK. It's a very simple plan. Basically, sports halls are determined by the size of badminton courts in the UK anyway. They're multi-purpose but they generate the footprint and this box we made as uh, one volume with a, a smaller building inside as a kind of um, changing room with an overlooking castle-like presence in the space. So this box within the volume is also made of cross-laminated timber. They under construction, the remarkable advantages of dry, fast, lightweight construction were evident. So this was done extremely quickly. The building was finished in six weeks as a structure, a waterproof structure. And then, obviously, there was more time for internal fit-out, but not a great deal because it did not require any other finishes, no plasterboard, no paint, no um, layers of construction. It simply timber and timber insulation. We made a hyperbolic paraboloid roof, this kind of double curvature from flat pieces of timber. So by making the panels thin and flexible, we were able to generate the curvature, which I wanted to have as a skate park. Skate park for the students, but in the end, we didn't have enough money to really make a, a safe accessible environment at this stage, so the plan is to do that later. Nevertheless, the space is wonderful because there's daylight, whereas in most school sports halls in the UK it's a steel frame and there's no windows. 
So they're very noisy and they're very dark. And this, as soon as it was made, proved um, to be the most popular destination in the school, as, uh, as they call it, the, the church for sport. A little bit more on the construction. You can see perhaps that these are the very large panels and these beams are laminated timber beams. So the roof is carried on these and then they carry from a load-bearing wall. So there's no frame. It's a panelized construction. It's not making a frame and then filling in a frame, which is, the, if you like, the, the trope of modern architecture. It's a bit like making a model. It's simply making a model at one-to-one. -one. And here you can see the panels being craned into position and some of the ways that we reinforce the panels by adding pieces of timber so that they can span or by taking the weight of the roof down with more timber attached to the horizontal panels. The cutouts for the windows were determined by the shapes of musical instruments for this adjacent music classroom. The music department were very strong in this school and we wanted to celebrate that with a very beautiful performance space of their own and some bespoke furniture, which again was the offcut, so the idea of no waste. Now this project, which Sebastian mentioned, uh, Endless Stair, started as an homage to a Dutch artist, Escher. Cornelius Escher um, in fact taught my father and is very uh, world renowned graphic artist and designer. His impossible landscapes of continual spaces and interlocking spaces have always inspired me. As a child we had books of Escher in the house and when I was invited to make a, a kind of installation landmark for the London Festival of Architecture, I thought it might be fun to take what is normally an internal component of architecture, namely the staircase, and take it outside and to try and celebrate all the things about staircases that we don't normally think about too much. I mean, think of a staircase as a way to get upstairs, but in fact... It's also the most social of spaces. It's where you pass people closely. It's an intimate space. It's also something which is, if you like, sculpture's gift to architecture. And in that sense, it provided a perfect opportunity to experiment with form, structure, and also material. And the American Hardwood Export Council sponsored the festival with free material, and they offered very a big range of um, special, high-quality American hardwoods. And I, I said, I politely declined on the basis that I wanted something that we could transform into a special material. So I wanted the cheapest, most expedient timber they had. And that was tulip wood, which grows in abundance in the U.S. They have so much they don't know what to do with it all. And it's not highly regarded. It's generally used for making skirting boards, or um, joinery, which is then painted. So I said, yeah, we'll take that. And we laminated it, cross-laminated it, into these very beautiful panels and used very particular engineered timber cutting tools and joints, which, um, I mean, th this level of technique is only really possible in Switzerland at the moment, but they, they've devised ways of extending the glue area with these interlocking joints, finger joints, and the, the cross-laminating process, you can see, is also interlocking here. Anyway, this my colleague Jonas Lenser and I testing the prototype of the stair. The stair was simply made of one profile of timber, used in many different ways. Used as tread, balustrade, staggered in plan, staggered in section. That was the context for the first showing of the stair, and that was the composition. But the idea 
of the endless stair was that it was not a stairway to heaven, endlessly long, it was simply endlessly reconfigurable. So you could disassemble it and reconfigure it in a different way according to the site. So this is, for example, London, and that is Milan. Or well, that is Milan. A simpler version using less components and the rest being used for something else. So the idea was to make, um, if you like, a useful art. Another example of um, a response to the invitation to make not a building, but a monument, if you like, from an art gallery in a city called Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes is a 1970s city that is absolutely uniform steel and glass construction. It's famous for it. It's, um, it's a little bit like a film set. It's an entirely gridded city with a quite elegant series of uh, Mies van der Rohe inspired architecture. A bit like MIT but without the class of Mies's actual architecture. This is local authority of Milton Keynes paying homage to Mies van der Rohe's steel and glass architecture and when invited to celebrate 40 years of the city my response was to say okay you've got a horizontal steel and glass city we'll make a, a vertical timber tower for you from which you can see you can oversee the whole city so this was the first time cross laminated timber was used um, more than four stories high because all the regulations in Europe at the time for timber stopped any higher than four stories for reasons of fire. Those, that code did not exist in the UK, so I thought it was a good opportunity to experiment with a high structure to demonstrate that it is possible and no more vulnerable to fire because the timber is hard. It's mass timber and it, it those of you who've tried to put a tree in a fire on a campfire will know it doesn't burn. It simply chars and protects itself. The same goes for cross laminated timber and all the family, the wide family of mass timber, they protect themselves from fire. It's small sections of timber which are vulnerable, not the big sections. So this was how we did it. We prefabricated a very tall stairwell to demonstrate that a building core, like a lift shaft, could, could be in timber. This is the equivalent of seven stories. Um, so we made, we made 101 steps to the top from which you can survey the steel and glass city. And the other idea with this installation was that it could be dismantled and every piece could be unscrewed and reused again in another context and the pieces fit inside the shipping container were well actually two in this case and could be taken by any form of transport that can tape, take containers. And most of the world is geared up for container infrastructure roads, railways, shipping, even aer airplanes. Another project about testing was the Tower of Love. This was an invitation to make a wedding um, chapel. And the site was Blackpool. And Blackpool is a, a city in the UK that is famous for holiday makers and a certain kind of decadence, a little bit like Las Vegas. So um, the mayor who invited us to uh, enter the competition and, and we won, said in the first brief briefing that um, in its heyday, Blackpool um, offered the venue for um, holidays um, from factory workers in the nearby steelmaking towns. And they, but this is before cheap air, air travel, of course. Up until the 90, late 1970s, this was the scene at Blackpool. Now Blackpool is less popular, but it's still the site of romance and still where people have um, two types of wedding. The quick wedding over the weekend where um, not even your family come and then the, the more planned wedding which is a much more 
lavish, serious affairs. It was a difficult brief because our building had to cater for both types. Not only was it a venue for weddings, but it also had to provide space for um, entertainment, a restaurant with sea views. It also had to provide local um, tourist information. So it's got three programs, really. The tower was the site for the main chapel, if you like, the main space of a beautiful space that focused on the Blackpool Tower, a bit like a camera focuses on a wedding couple. So this is a, a beautiful chamber at the top, which is both a vertical and horizontal cantilever in timber, and that's the roof deck of the restaurant below. The project was not just about cross-laminated timber, it was also uh, an opportunity to investigate and develop another new material, and this being recycled glass mixed with concrete. The marine atmosphere of Blackpool meant that obviously the timber had to be protected from it. So we, we decided to use two materials, the base of which is a mixture of recycled uh, wood waste and cement and the broken bottles of beer and wine that you normally see on the pavement in Sunday morning in Blackpool. And this we made into a new uh, very beautiful block which is still um, manufactured by this company that prior to that had just made concrete blocks. Above, above that ligna site, as it's called, is stainless steel cladding with um, a gold coating providing the landmark structure that the cancer wanted and also um, playing up the form of the wedding space, which, as I mentioned before, was all about celebrating the view of the tower at the, the special moment. And I think, you know, wh why is this Tower of Love a powerful little building to enter? And I think it's, it's not just about devices like the framing of views, it's also because of what is not there. It's the... Um, lack of plasterboard, the lack of paint, the lack of ceilings, suspended ceilings, the lack of ducts, the lack of grills. It's just wood and delight. After this project, we collaborated with uh, Norwegian architects called Helen and Howard on a project called uh, Rönduskogen. Rönduskogen means the wooded hill, a little bit like this, a site on a steep hill, a steep slope, in a climate where it's either dark all the time or light all the time. Can you imagine the extremes that the Norwegians live with? So in summer, their summer is three to four weeks long, and the sun never sets. The inverse applies for the rest of the year, so that at certain times of the year, in deepest, the deepest days of January and February, um, right now, they will not have any light. They'll have literally an hour. So you can wake up, go to work, it's dark. And um, during the morning, the sun comes up and then goes down, so that by the time it's lunchtime, it's already dark again. And consequently, light is so precious that we had to model the building entirely on its aspect. So that's north. Legally, you're not allowed to put living rooms north because you would deprive people of the precious daylight. And all of the living accommodation has to face southwest, south, southeast. And it, it's um, also a method by which we could make tall buildings um, and deal with the wind passing over it. It's a very windy country. We made large models. These were exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2008, and they tried to develop the idea of uh, a tree-like structure. 
containing a core, as in a trunk, and then the branches and foliage represent the um, apartments themselves. This was important, the tree concept was important not just for the love of trees but also for the sense in which the landscape is not um, covered by buildings like these. These existing buildings arranged around a Viking burial mound I thought were um, barriers to the freedom of people to move around and enjoy this incredible view. So we lifted our buildings up off this landscape in order to preserve those views, but also to provide protected, sheltered areas at entrances so that, you know, if you subscribe to live in a tower, would you want to live on the ground floor? So we removed the ground floor and put social functions there, children's play areas, entrances, community rooms, but also provided open space at grade, open space that allowed the continuous views of the fjord and, and gave you an area to enter where you, you don't get snowed on. In the end, this building was a hybrid. The client was a concrete contractor. We took him a long way, but he didn't want to do the whole thing in timber. So it was a, a hybrid structure where we were able to reduce the concrete to just the core in other words, the stairs and the lift uh, and bathrooms and kitchens that were all clustered in the middle of the plan. So if I show you there, this, that's concrete, the rest is timber. Which is also okay, you know, sometimes you can't succeed in persuading the people who finance projects that you have to make a uh, completely radical new structure. We have, for that reason though, carried out research to demonstrate very carefully the advantages and disadvantages. I can't think of many disadvantages at all of timber other than needing to protect it externally from the weather. Otherwise it's just a win-win situation. For example, in the equivalent concrete and timber building, these Every single balcony offers a cold bridge opportunity so that the cold creeps in and you get condensation and water inside. It doesn't exist in a timber building. The timber simply naturally deals with it as an insulated material. Um, so this can, the floors can simply be taken out as balconies. Things like um, the overall thickness of the build-up, you can have less less of a build-up overall in a timber building, in a concrete building. There's usually downstand beams under which services generally pass and this makes the whole building um, effectively lower internally or higher externally depending on which way you look at it. You can see here even from where you are, you don't need to read the, the small print, but you can see the equivalent structure of a laminate a cross-laminated timber building. That's the floor slab there. Concrete with the necessary insolence and cladding and plasterboard brings you to there. Even if you plasterboarded your timber building for sand reasons, it still ends up being a slimmer building and therefore more economic when you go to many stories. Also, you can reduce the thickness according to the difference in load. So the higher up a building, the thinner the walls can get. So pretty much every project that we do at DRMM is, is a sort of pushing of the boundaries and experimenting with the medium in order to replace what is normally a steel or concrete building with a timber, a new kind of timber construction. This is a, a health and fitness club that we carried out for Sky, T T Sky TV, who I notice are in India um, in collaboration with... Um, with Tata Steel, is that right? I've seen on the way here adverts showing both their logos. Well here, Sky TV got a building that only used steel for balconies, which is a good use of steel. And they were so impressed with it, they went on to build 
a massive building next to our health and fitness club. They built this first very large office building entirely in timber. This was an experiment to make a fully timber building. I noticed in the factory that when the panels were lifted, they bent and thought this was actually a very beautiful thing, much nicer than simply being a flat panel. And the idea emerged to try and use that possibility in a building that was specifically about health. So Maggie's Oldham is a project about learning to live with cancer and somewhere to... Maggie's are a charity who offer care to not just cancer patients but their families and friends and those who always suffer at the same time as the cancer victim. And these are ideas that we developed to, to make a completely healthy construction. So that this is the timber wall, that's timber waste um, insulation. So the dust, the shavings are compacted into a very thick panel, but it's entirely breathable construction. And then battens and then a special cladding which I uh, invented from the same material as this, namely the tulip wood timber and made uh, a cooked version of it. It's baked, and this thermal modification uh, drives out all the enzymes from the timber, and obviously any moisture, and creates uh, a weatherproof exterior. That's the plan. It's conceived of as a very simple box with its big curved wall that separates the open plan from the cellular spaces. So these are consulting rooms, offices, toilets and the like. And then the big space is the inspirational space for those needing to be with other people who share similar problems. And we thought the nicest way to do it was not with um, formal gymnastics but simply the presence of nature at the heart of the building. So it's literally a very beautiful box with a hole in it through which a tree passes. This is to show you how it was made. The simple, very carefully made, beautiful laminated panels of tulip wood craned into position. It doesn't take skill. Any crane driver can lift panels of any kind. There's no difference from steel construction, it's just that it's a, a more benign material. You bolt it together in similar ways to steel. There's no need for any noisy or dirty activities on site. There's no wet trades, there's no concrete. This is a 100% timber building on six steel columns to keep it out of the ground. So those columns, you can just see one here recessed to make the building look like it's hovering and to position it very carefully above this old wall and next to the existing cancer center in this quite um, tough northern town, a town that was a textile industry and now economically on its knees. This is underneath the building. So the idea of lifting the building up was to create a floor level that's equivalent with the old cancer building and simultaneously making a sheltered special garden as a, an external room for the people of the whole hospital, not just of the Maggie's building. The site did not have trees on it. Um, the garden wasn't there. We persuaded the hospital to demolish an old mortuary and replace that with this new garden and new building above it. So the Mackey's building is a kind of manifesto for timber architecture, really. Uh, pretty much every material there is a type of timber except the floor. The floor we made as um, a continuous um, non-chemical resin. So it's a bit like a, a, it's a natural resin mixed with um, rubber, latex. 
to give it this beautiful color and uh, a seamless structure. The, the timber on the ceiling is an acoustic um, solution to uh, the idea of a naturally vented space. So th air is taken above the ceiling across the box of the building and drops down and at the same time sand travels up and is trapped in that same void. So it's an open plenum. There are no ducts. There are simply holes on each side of the building through which the air passes. It's drawn through. And each one of these is the waste material from manufacturing the cross-laminated timber walls, which you can see here. So all of the offcuts we took from the factory and used in the ceiling. So these, that's site, that's site construction, and the, that's factory prefabrication. This is cork for the kitchen cupboards. This is a very large piece of walnut for the kitchen. The table is something that um, I'd already made separately in the same cross-laminated timber as a, a kind of experiment to make a big furniture for a show and the client, Maggie's, were very happy to have this as a kind of centerpiece for this place. And, and the idea for that, and this is really to show that even furniture can, can symbolize and communicate bigger design intentions. This was very much a piece to demonstrate that um, timber really is the best material to use for furniture. It has the warmth and the solidity and the beauty that people want to live with and, and touch. This design was based on just cutting circles from large panels and stacking them as rings. There is a void to make it lighter and there is a recess for con holding fruit or whatever in the plane of the very large two meter diameter of the table. It was made by students like yourselves. I worked alongside them. We borrowed some amazing machinery to turn it. It was um, a real pleasure to make something of, of quality. I think the the idea of uh, simplicity is, is a long and stony road. You know, it's much easier to make something complicated than it is to make something simple and beautiful. So choices, care, um, care and quality in construction, they matter a lot. Now, that's the end of the lecture of examples of work, I want to read you a kind of manifesto. I call it uh, a reverse manifesto. You obviously recognize the landscape as your own. Um, I, s I struggle with air conditioning I, I find it endlessly irritating. And this was a hotel room where, as soon as you opened the window, you realized that the whole design of the building was requiring air conditioning. So this reverse manifesto goes like this. Wood is a very poor material to use if you're seeking to pollute the planet. It's probably the worst choice you could make as an engineer an architect or designer. If you're looking to permanently release yet more carbon into the ozone layer, choose another material and therefore promote its manufacture. Wood is hopeless at producing toxins and carbon. Wood is a last resort for those wishing to specify a heavy material. If you want additional structural dead loads, you will have to look to almost any other material. Its nearest rivals are way heavier. Wood is hopelessly lightweight, especially given its high strength. Choose another material if you need bigger foundations and you want to employ more machinery and people lifting on site. Wood in the form of engineered construction timber is bad at living up to the slow building processes preferred certainly by the UK construction industry. 
off-site manufactured precision really is the enemy of delays on site. So if you need a snail's pace build with a, a snail's pace build with inevitable delays and resultant disputes, avoid wood at all costs. Wood in buildings is notoriously smelly. Its natural tendency to give off oxygenated natural aromas can irritate those who prefer the damp, cloying odor of wet trades combined with dust and chemical adhesives. This applies to initial construction as well as later alterations. And this extends the problem of smell as wood is readily altered on site if necessary and does not share its rival's advantages of being inflexible to change. If you need to cut out another window later, be prepared for ease and fresh air with wood. Wood does not need covering internally, so this is bad news for buildings designed to incorporate a lot of layers and many subsequent trades, all of whom need interface coordination and quality control. There are far fewer trades to blame each other, which can make contract litigation less lucrative. Wood is also extremely poor at offering surfaces that are inherently cold and unattractive to touch. This is a distinct disadvantage for plasterers, painters, and finishers. Wood is low on the performing index of stress-inducing materials. If your building needs to increase the heart rate of its occupants and decrease the effectiveness of the vagus nerve that protects the heart from attack, choose a regular alternative to wood. Austrian schools without stress research studies Document how much better other materials are at provoking or inducing respiratory and allergenic problems. So if you need an unhealthy building material, don't use wood. Finally, wood is at the very back of the queue when it comes to being a finite resource. If your project has to be made from limited materials that need to be laboriously manufactured, with the consequences of side effects instead of just grown naturally. Look elsewhere. Wood can never match that. Right. Okay. The Avni, Avni Timber Workshop project is five days, Monday to Friday, five intentions. Those intentions are to make something useful for the students on campus chosen from student proposals. It's to work as a collaborative team. It's to only use local ordinary timber, eucalyptus and coconut, to make something special. And it's to learn about decision making as well as timber making. Finally, it's to make an example of useful art. That's it. I, I still believe that the success of the 20th century will be defined by how well we grow and how well we use timber. And I'd like to thank you for listening to me. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and, and your questions. Thank you. So are there any questions? We can have the lights on, I guess. Come. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your presentation. And I really like your uh, exploration of wood and, and timbers. So my question is that uh, what do you think about the durability and extension uh, uh, durability of wooden structures in our Kerala context? So I couldn't, can you ask me again? I couldn't really hear. Uh, what do you think about the durability of wooden structures or timber structures yeah. in Kerala yeah. and in India? 
the humidity is very different here. So, and you have insects that don't exist in northern climates. So I would say um, it's very important to keep the buildings out of the ground so that the insects can't travel up. So the idea of placing timber buildings on the ground would probably be vulnerable here. And in terms of the rainy season, it's simply a question of detailing. So the modernist uh, flat roof doesn't work on a timber building. You really need to throw the water beyond, you know. You need an eaves. You need a, a broader roof than the, the walls of the building. But it's quite simple. I mean, I'm a great believer in trying to use what is, is regional. So a, a kind of regional modernism, really. And therefore, making the, uh, making the building not only from local timber, but cladding it in what works locally. And I think um, there's probably a great many uh, non-toxic possibilities here. Uh, for example, uh, instead of corrugated steel as a cladding, there is now um, corrugated hemp. Hemp is a, a wonderful crop for absorbing carbon, grows very quickly, and has a number of uh, products made from it. So I'm not just talking about cannabis, I'm talking about um, hemp that makes uh, choir on cloth, all kinds of matting, and can also be used and mixed with a little bit of cement to make blocks. Not dissimilar from these, but um, a, a totally organic, waterproof version of corrugated metal is possible out of this hemp material. So if I was to build here, that's the kind of thing I would approach. How, how was your experience of uh, introducing such a new material uh, towards uh, people and how, uh, how was easy to convince such a new material to clients? Uh, how was that experience? Yeah, I, I've been trying to persuade clients for 25 years of the need to build in a different way. And um, not always it has to be timber, but just to build in a way that is environmentally responsible. And some clients are totally great and up for it. But I would say probably the majority need to be persuaded and they need evidence and they need finally to be reassured that it won't cost a lot more. But I think the biggest obstacle is not the clients. The, the, the main problem is banks and uh, financial authorities who lend the money for buildings and who think of collateral in the shape of bricks and concrete. So they don't understand that timber is as um, long-lasting, if built properly, as long-lasting as any, any other type of building. I mean, in the UK, there are medieval buildings that are a thousand years old even, you know, not even hundreds of years, but there are buildings that have lasted all kinds of disasters and fires made of timber. And look at Japanese temples or Chinese temples, you know, it's, um, it's perfectly doable. But local authorities, uh, insurance companies, you know, building control, finance houses, these are the obstacles. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, wood is the product of uh, deforestation. So how do we deal with it and is there any solution to avoid uh, this problem? Yeah, plant more trees. We need to plant f at least four. For you plant four for every one that you cut because one will not grow, one will be cut 
uh, and you need more than you started with, so you end up with two. So I, I think, seriously, we all have to plant trees and have to include trees in all of our design work, but you should only buy construction timber from companies who take it from managed forestry. So that, that's an important point that you raise. All of the projects shown, the timber is very carefully sourced from companies who work very closely with forests in Germany, Austria, Finland, um, across Scandinavia and Northern Europe. And these are local forests owned by families and those families want to give their children the forest in better condition. So they're always planting more than they're cutting. Questions coming thick and fast now. Uh, hello, sir. So, sir, you've uh, constructed such beautiful, uh, you know, architecture around the world. But how can we implant this idea of using new materials? Because not every, almost everybody is skeptical about it. But how can we, maybe as students, implant this idea that you know you have to be using new materials mm. or in a new and effective way, other than installations or well, I mean, I've chosen to speak mainly about timber, so I'll, I'll just talk about timber. But there are obviously many very ecologically interesting materials around or emer emerging. But in the case of timber, you can say it's not a new material. You can say this is the oldest building material in the world. You can say the ancient Egyptians mostly lived in timber houses. You only see the temples of stone, but in fact the people lived in timber and its continuous use timber means that it's very widely um, recognized and developed it's not a new it's like, you know it's only the people who can only think uh, in concrete and steel who think timber is a new material you know the rest of the world has always built with timber I mean I've got some amazing um, painting Reproduction, a, a reproduction of a painting of uh, a 17th century very long span bridge in Switzerland. And it's incredible. I mean, the span is amazing. You know. There are a great many examples around the world of very special timber buildings that people just don't realize were timber. I mean, if, if for example, you look at, say, you look at Pier Luigi Nervi, right, one of the greatest engineers the world has ever seen, Italian. He did concrete. I think of concrete as the 20th century. Right? Every century has a material. Pier Luigi Nervi, every single wonderful building he did in concrete, it was first a timber building because you have to use timber to make the shuttering to make the concrete. So literally, every masterpiece was a timber masterpiece that got thrown away. So I think that sh the memory of timber uh, in the process of making is there. People just need to be reminded that we have always used it. So uh, most of the, pro I'm talking about your projects, uh, you need a particular technology f to attain that, uh, particular kind of machineries to have that kind of cuts and everything. Uh, and we have lost the traditional wisdom like when they used to make this kind of bridges where the technology was not that advanced in contemporary terms. So what if somebody is starting in a place where there's this kind of machineries and technologies are not available, how to start? I mean, where will he start from? Mm. Because all this needs, like for example, the mixing of uh, concrete and timber and glass and highly compressed, all these things, they need a huge industries. So, so where, where one should start with? Well, you start with what you have and it's not always required. I mean, y you can be creative about anything. I, I think you, if you had to, you could make a wonderful building out of matchsticks. Just, you could. 
Matt sticks in glue and creativity. You don't necessarily have to have all the machinery. It helps. If it's there, you're going to use it, right? I mean, I do, obviously. And you're right. It does rely on big presses and so on. But I would still be able to make a beautiful timber building with no machinery. That's what I want to do as well. You know, it's, it's not... Um okay, let me put it another way. Cedric Price said... Uh, Technology is obviously the answer, but what was the question? Don't be dependent on it, because technology will let you down anyway. So, thank you all. Um, by this, we'll... Uh, we are concluding the formal presentation for the day. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Alex for sharing wonderful insights on the timber. It's definitely not a new material. It has been there always with us. So th it's you know, time for us to change our perspectives. So that's what most, uh, most importantly, that's, that's what we need to do. So our workshop, like, ha like he mentioned, it would be there for five days, starting from today until Friday. So um, we will sh soon be sharing the list of the students who would be enrolled for the workshop. So I also urge others to, you know, whenever you get some time, also, you know, walk by, come to the workshop and see the works that are going on and, you know, be engaged with the workshop in one way or the other. Unfortunately, um, you know, we have a limitation in the numbers, you know, for the students who could join the workshop. Um, yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank you once again.